The America's Democrats podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, is made possible by contributions from our listeners. Want to do more? Go to americasdemocrats.org and click donate. And thank you for allowing us to be your voice. And if you enjoy the show, please share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. This week, an extended conversation with Peniel E. Joseph on the still unfinished journey toward racial equality and true democracy in America. Plus, Bill Press with Julian Zelizer on how Newt Gingrich broke politics. Had enough of Fox News, the House Freedom Caucus, and Donald Trump? If you want the facts that you won't get from them or from the fake news sites of the alt-right, then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. Peniel E. Joseph is an American scholar, teacher, and leading public voice on race, democracy, and civil rights. He says within this moment of national crisis is a generational opportunity to transform American democracy to one that is free of racial injustice. And we say hello to Peniel E. Joseph, professor of public affairs and the Barbara Jordan Chair in Ethics and Political Values at the LBJ School of Public Affairs. He's also the founding director of the LBJ School's Center for the Study of Race and Democracy at the University of Texas at Austin. And he is the author of numerous books, including most recently, The Sword and the Shield, The Revolutionary Lives of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. Peniel Joseph, thanks very much for joining us again on the America's Democrats podcast. Thank you for having me, Jim. You're quite welcome. And I should say welcome back to the broadcast. Um, You've been writing recently about the meaning of Black Lives Matter protests that have been sweeping the nation. Sadly, George Floyd is not the first black man to die brutally from the actions of white police. Um, But as you have noted, we are witnessing an urgency we haven't seen in some time and maybe not ever. Why now? What, what is the political and social context fueling this movement? I think there's four points since 2008. One is the election of Barack Obama and the racial optimism that was unleashed after that election. Two is going to be the arrival of the Black Lives Matter movement in 2013, really in the aftermath of Trayvon Martin and then when we think about Michael Brown, Eric Garner, and others who were killed by the police, Black people who were killed by the police. Three is going to be the election of Donald Trump. And what that unleashes is really a a racial reckoning in the country with a president who is overtly appealing to white nationalism, overtly appealing to anti-Black racism, anti-immigrant sentiment um, to, to galvanize his base. And then finally, four is this year. So this year, the combination of the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the racial disparities that were amplified, pre-existing racial disparities that were amplified by that pandemic, and the shelter-in-place orders, um, stagnant economy, uh, millions of people out of work. And the George Floyd video happens uh, right at the point where uh, shelter-in-place orders are easing in many states. That video goes viral. Uh, there was the Amy Cooper video that preceded that. So when you think about history, his, history is always um, a cascading series of events. So those watershed pivot points over the last 12 years, I think what people didn't realize um, until now is that you, you are in the midst of a, of a third American reconstruction. I um, mean, when you think about reconstruction originally from 1865, Sometimes people say that ended in 1877. That's untrue. It's 1865 to 1896. And within that period, that 31 year period, you have both reconstruction and a resumption of white supremacy that exists side by side. So you have the first series of African-American men who could both vote and were elected officials. Uh, They built up public schools. They built up the first social welfare system in late 19th century America, including public hospitals and places for the poor. 
um, but they were also discriminated against and they were also victims of racial violence and not just the Klan, but just racial violence in states like Texas, South Carolina, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, that used violence to end black political power in those states. And what's important for us about the third reconstruction as opposed to the first, the first reconstruction and the third are really intimately connected. The convict lease system um, is, is connected to mass incarceration. And that was arresting African-American men and women for loitering, um, for not having a job and placing them in labor camps where local municipalities actually achieved a fee per inmate, right? And so when we think about this, uh, Douglas Blackman won a, a Pulitzer Prize for the great book, um, Slavery by Another Name. And so this is extraordinary history. The second reconstruction, of course, is the heroic period of the civil rights movement, voting rights, civil rights, um, the Brown decision. But the third is really interesting because I think the third, in a way, we tried to get justice from the inside out through Barack Obama. And now we're seeing justice trying to get it from the outside in with these, with these protests, these calls to defund the police. So we're really experiencing this watershed historical moment. And there's a poll to compare the intensity of today's Black Lives Matter movement to that of the movement for racial justice in the 1960s. But many of the aspirations of that time did not come to pass Otherwise, we may not be where we are today. Was this primarily a political failure? I think it was multiple shortcomings. I think there were definite victories when we think about the Civil Rights Act of 64, Voting Rights Act of 65. Um, but we were never able to tackle systemic racism uh, in all aspects of our society. And I think that Martin Luther King Jr. tried with the Poor People's Campaign in an effort to get universal basic income for Black people, but all Americans. And after King's death in 1968, we really had 52 years of um, investing in a criminal justice system in a carceral state that punishes, incarcerates, dehumanizes, segregates largely Black and Brown populations. So I'd say it's a political failure, but it was also a moral failure. And we knew at the time that we were failing, but uh, those who were anti-racist certainly were defeated at the polls, when you think about the 1968 election, the 1972 election, and certainly as um, fear and, and crime sparked in the late 60s, early 70s, instead of choosing the beloved community that Dr. King talked about, which was free of racial injustice, where, where young people were heavily invested in, um, it was free of, of uh, inequality, we invested in law and order. And so that law and order, uh, mass incarceration philosophy, ideology, really is the tip of the spear of what killed uh, George Floyd. It perpetuated the, ho the whole thing, really, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, yeah. Despite our nation's failures to make significant progress in, in terms of racial justice, you write of this moment not with cynicism, mm -hmm. but with a sense of hope. How do you maintain a sense of hope this time can be different? Well, I think it's like we celebrated Juneteenth. We celebrated the 4th of July. And this year, people are talking about Frederick Douglass's very famous 1852 speech, What to the Slave is, a fourth of, is the 4th of July. I think the hope is uh, really within both Black and uh, white allies, Latinx, others who historically have always really deeply invested in an expansive vision of American democracy. So Martin Luther King Jr. talked about the great wells of democracy that were dug deep by the founding fathers. Of course, we realized that the founders had huge blind spots, <laughs> slavery being one of them. Um, but this idea of democracy is this um, great thing, this idea of representative democracy, this idea that people can collectively rule themselves, but also care for others. Um, while also having individual achievement um, and collective uh, responsibility. Uh, and I think that that idea is very, very important for us. So even though we've had these past failures or shortcomings, um, we have the data where 4,700 separate demonstrations took place over the, over the last uh, five weeks. We have the data where anywhere from 
seven to 26 million Americans uh, uh, participated in these demonstrations. These are the largest social justice, racial justice demonstrations in American history. So all of that means that people want uh, the beloved community that Dr. King talked about, and it's up to all of us to roll up our sleeves and, and to work hard to try to achieve that. Mm -hmm. You recently wrote in the Dallas Morning News that elections matter in this struggle. Is it a challenge to convince other black Americans that elections matter when politicians have let them down so often before? Yeah, I think it's a challenge also because of just voter suppression and mechanisms that are designed to make sure that that population does not vote. And when we think about voter suppression, that is both anti-black, but it's anti-poor people, it's anti-young people. So I do think that part of the onus is on all of us. And I think when you see so many people out in the streets uh, is to tell them that democracy is in the streets, but it's also at the polling booths. And part of your citizenship rights is, um, is voting and, and having your children who are of age to vote and, and showing them that example. So I do think that, yes, it's about people who've been let down before by politicians, but I'd say primarily right now, it's about systems and mechanisms that are designed to suppress votes and to be anti-democratic. And that's always the paradox about living in a democracy. You can be around people who are anti-democratic, who have the same rights that you do, who are actually trying to suppress your rights as a citizen. We want you to sit back and listen to this AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. I believe that we must pass legislation to provide medical care. This is our tradition. When our grandparents came to America, it was the Democratic Party which said, Welcome. It was the Democratic Party, the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Kennedy and others, who said that America belonged to all its people, not just a handful of the rich or a few giant corporations. That's why great leaders like FDR fought so hard for Social Security and why JFK stood up to the insurance companies and their Republican allies to get Medicare. It's not just one thing or one time in one place. It's about a whole history of standing up to the Republicans and saying someone has to be on the side of regular working people in America, whether it's defending Social Security or just the way your loved ones are treated on the job. That's what the Democratic Party is all about. And that's why this message has been brought to you by the Democratic Party. Working people like you and me. Paid for by 21st Century Democrats. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. We're speaking with Peniel E. Joseph, founding director of the LBJ Schools Center for the Study of Race and Democracy and author most recently of The Sword and the Shield, The Revolutionary Lives of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. Coming up next, what he wants us to hear in growing calls to defund the police and abolish prisons. But first, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his Common Sense Commentary. The holy mantra of health professionals was coined about 2,500 years ago by the Greek physician Hippocrates. Do no harm. Of course, that was before corporate health care took charge and asserted a new guiding ethic. Jack up profits. Putting this in practice, America's largest and richest hospital chains rushed to the front of the COVID-19 bailout line this spring to pull $15 billion from the government's emergency fund. They pocketed the taxpayers' money despite sitting on tens of billions of dollars of their own cash reserves. But hold your nose, for it gets much stinkier. The bailout was intended to keep hospital workers on the job, yet the wealthiest chains have hit nurses, janitors, and other crucial frontline staffers with layoffs, pay cuts, and deadly shortages of protective gear. For example, HCA, the $36 billion a year behemoth that's wallowing in profits, snatched a billion-dollar taxpayer bailout for itself, then demanded hospital staffers accept wage freezes, elimination of company pension payments, and other cuts, or have thousands of their jobs eliminated. 
However, in a public show of compassion, HCA's chief executive, Samuel Hazen, donated two months of his $1.4 million salary to an employee support fund. How magnanimous. Uh, no. His generosity is a deception, not a sacrifice. The trick is that a CEO's salary is a minuscule part of total pay. Hazen's annual bonus, stock payouts, and other compensation will raise his actual pay to $26 million this year. So his donation is less than 1% of his pay, and almost certainly he will write that off his income taxes. So we taxpayers underwrite his fat take-home and also subsidize his face-saving philanthropic gimmick. This is Jim Hightower saying, what we have here is a raging virus of executive sweet greed doing deeper damage to our society than COVID-19 ever could. If you'd like more of Jim Hightower's real populism, check out the Hightower Lowdown. Jim's monthly newsletter gives you the real lowdown on which corporations, by name, are doing what to the middle class, our environment, and our democracy. Each month, the Hightower Lowdown brings you facts you didn't know, along with actions you can take to fight back. It also comes with a sense of humor. Hightower believes we can fight the gods and still have fun. Plus, get this, it's cheap. Only $15 brings you 12 issues a year. For real populism, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. We're speaking with Peniel E. Joseph, founding director of the LBJ Schools Center for the Study of Race and Democracy, and author most recently of The Sword and the Shield, The Revolutionary Lives of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. Peniel, a key rallying cry for today's movement for racial justice is a call to defund the police. We're also hearing a call to abolish prisons. Rather than dismiss these measures as impractical, what do you want Americans to hear when they hear these demands? Both of those calls are really for freedom and liberation. Americans thought that abolition, in this case, abolition of slavery, was too radical in the 18th and 19th century, even though people wanted the abolition of slavery. Some Americans thought that voting rights for African Americans and then women's suffrage, women's full and equal uh, rights to participate in our democracy were too, was too radical. Some people thought racial integration <laughs> was too radical. This idea of desegregating neighborhoods, public schools, they said this was too radical. Some people have said that um, in the context of the 1950s and 60s, people talked about, and Americans with Disabilities Act, people talked about uh, queer rights and uh, LGBTQ um, having access. People said no. Now we have gay marriage, now we have Americans with Disabilities Act. So we have to remember, I would, I would caution everyone, until you mainstream justice, including the nine to five work week. America used to be a, a place, and I can show you America 100 years ago, where children eight and nine and 10 years old, Jim, were working in coal mines. I can show you that. This is the United States of America. We said, you know what, this is elite, this should be, this is immoral, and this should be illegal. And we made that happen. So until you mainstream justice for everyone, people say, this is, you're going too far here. And so defund the police, all it means is that let's reimagine public safety. Let's fully fund poor communities all across the United States. Imagine an America with no wrong side of the tracks, right? And when we say abolish prisons, all we're saying is that prisons as they stand right now in America do not work. <laughs> they just simply don't work. So we want a, some kind of situation where people are rehabilitated and some institution that's not a prison that works towards rehabilitation. And even if there are going to be some people who, are, who cannot be mainstream into society, they're not in prison because right now what we've seen, we have a long track record. We have the data. Prisons don't work. And the way in which we've set up the criminal justice system, it doesn't work. Not just for Black people, but for our democracy, because all of us should be pro-democracy, because that's what's so important about the United States of America. The only way we can be liberty's surest guardian is if we are the most vibrant democracy uh, on the face of the, the, the earth. One of the, one of the issues that I see and hear from people when they hear defund the police, abolish prisons, they're not understanding the explanation that you just gave. They're, all they're hearing is defund the police, which means get rid of the police. You can't call 911 anymore. And you know, I just I slap my forehead and think, no, you know, you're not. That's not what we're saying here. 
That's not what this abolished prison is. Do we need to change the messaging on this to get more people to understand? No. And the reason I say that is the examples that I've given before. When we talked about abolition, uh, people thought that that was the abolition of their way of life. And for some people, it was going to be because we were saying, look, racial slavery is a bad thing. It's immoral. It should be illegal. Um, when you said voting rights, some people said, hey, this is too radical. This is going to destroy my way of life. And it really could because you were ruling over people who didn't have the same participatory democratic rights as others. Uh, when people said women's suffrage, and even now we live in a country that did not pass the Equal Rights Amendment. The ERA came a few, few states shy of being a constitutional amendment. Every woman, as, and I'm saying this both as a girl dad, but just as a citizen, should be making uh, equal pay for equal work. The fact that women are still viewed as some other class of citizens in the United States is a tragedy. And this is something that should not be. So we can't change the messaging. I think what we do is say this, absolutely. We explain what we mean, but one day it will be mainstream. One day it will be. The, the, the positive about American history is not necessarily that it goes and travels in a linear fashion, but Dr. King talked about the arc of the moral universe uh, is long, but it bends towards justice. At times, people, we're talking about workers, we're talking about white allies, we're certainly talking about black people, black women especially, Latinx, farm workers, Dolores Huerta, Cesar Chavez, they, indigenous uh, folks, they bend history's moral arc towards justice, right? And they've done it overseas in wars, but they've also bled for democracy domestically, which we don't remember, <laughs> including just this year. Bleeding for democracy is both domestic and international. So the positive for us is this. We actually can, um, what James Baldwin called, achieve our country, achieve a different country where um, it's multiracial, it's multicultural, it's expansively democratic, and we actually take care of each other even while we retain our individual identities. We can do it. Um, and and it, for those of us who actually, you, if you believe in the ideal of America at its most expansive, not at its most flawed, but at its most expansive, you understand how, what a rich um, tapestry we've created and that we could if we if we do say we want human rights and social justice for all people. So I say defend the, de defund the police, prison abolition. These are things that we have to absolutely mainstream, but, but don't, ever, um, don't ever go back on your audacious freedom dreams. Robin Kelly talks about audacious freedom dreams. This is the time that we should be thinking about healthcare, about the environment, about centering racial justice, about women, about domestic violence, about uh, people who are being sexually trafficked and harassed, homelessness. All of us are connected to somebody who's got mental or emotional challenges. All of us are connected to somebody who needs a healthcare system that's gonna take care of them, whether they have diabetes, whether they have heart trouble, whether, whether. We, we can build that community and that society. And that's what's so hopeful about this time. And we're, we're slow to, to react, and I guess it's just because we don't like change and that sort of thing, but, but it does feel like we're heading in the right direction. I, I don't want to be too presumptuous, but it really feels like with everything that's going on, especially during the year of 2020, we're heading in the right direction. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, I think we have a lot of work to do. We have a generational opportunity, Jim. Uh, to really transform American democracy. It starts with ending systemic racism. We defeat white supremacy. Um, but there's a supply chain of misery and grief in this country and a supply chain of power and privilege. And we have to stop uh, connecting those supply chains based on race, right? That the only way you can be connected to the power, uh, the privilege, having a good life is based on race. And the only way the reason why you're connected to the misery and the grief is based on race, race and class and gender and sexuality. So we need intersectional justice, but the fact that people are rethinking monuments, the fact that so many Americans have come out in the street and said that black lives matter, and they understand that when you say black lives matter, you are not um, taking away from other lives, you are acknowledging um, the systemic racism, the, 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 the way in which we live now, and you, 
you want human rights for all people. The fact that we've had that kind of mass education in really the shortest amount of time, you've got all these anti-racist books on the New York Times bestsellers list. <laughs> you've got different, different, and really our politicians, Jim, are the last ones to catch up. We have to remember Martin Luther King Jr. and social movements, they were ready for a Voting Rights Act, Civil Rights Act. John F. Kennedy does his great June 11th, 1963 race speech at 8 p.m. saying that there's a revolution at hand only after Birmingham, only after. And he says, Kennedy says that evening that uh, those who do nothing invite shame as well as violence. Those who act boldly recognize right as well as reality. This is JFK and that was the best speech on racial justice the president had given since Lincoln. And then obviously LBJ does even, even, even more. Mm -hmm. We only come to terms during these times of crisis. So our political leaders, they will follow us. So if we demand, including white men, white women, people who are straight, if they demand access for black people and equality, for gay people, for queer people, that's when the politicians say, guess what? Not only is gay marriage good, <laughs> <laughs> but racial justice is good, right? And so we are the leaders we have been waiting for. Barack Obama said it in 2008, but he was absolutely right. We pawned it off to President Obama. He'll fix it. And then we took the next eight years off. Not the activists, but just ordinary Americans. We are the leaders we've been waiting for. We have to center anti-racism in our lives, our children, our grandchildren's lives, and we have to make it this lifelong pursuit. And it's going to take generations but we can make substantial progress right here in our own lifetimes. And that's what's so exciting. It's so exciting to be alive right now. It is. It is. Uh, now, the other thing, Peniel, that we're, we're hearing about, it's, it's a resurgent discussion around reparations. Does it seem to you that the nation may actually be ready for this conversation? I think so. I think right now the great book on this is William Darity's From Here to Equality, um, uh, which is a comprehensive account of both the movement and the why in terms of racial reparations. Uh, I think we're ready for that conversation. Um, we have this incredible wealth gap between blacks and whites. Uh, Professor Darity argues that every black family that can trace at least one descendant back to racial slavery should be getting $800,000 uh, from the government. That would cost about $12 trillion in 2016 money. Um, I do think it's time to have that conversation. Uh, it was great that there were some certain Democratic candidates like uh, Cory Booker who, who uh, were ready to have that conversation. So I think the only way you're ever going to get the same kind of economic parity, and we're not talking about income here, we're talking about wealth. We're talking about wealth. We're talking about what you can bequeath to your children. And we have to remember, not only have Black people been denied that access to racial slavery, they were denied it again after slavery too. So from 1865 to the present, just a few things, a convict lease system, no 40 acres and a mule, land that black people bought was taken away from them um, uh, through, through, through heirs property and just you know billions of dollars of land. But also when we think about the second world war and the new deal, um, G, the GI bill is 15% of the GDP of the federal budget rather uh, by 1948, and Black people don't have access to the GI Bill. They don't have access to the FHA 30-year low-interest mortgages. Uh, the great book is uh, uh, Ira Katz Nelson's When Affirmative Action Was White, and Richard Rothstein's The Color of Law, which is now on the bestsellers list, which really looks at racial discrimination in housing, in taxes, in public schools, <laughs> in zoning. I mean, he does it, and I teach that book, too. So, we have a lot of work to do, but reparations is, is part of this. And I think the reparations goes beyond the policy of reparations, but also the public acknowledgement. The Tulsa massacre is a great example that these things happen. And uh, it, when we get to an anti-racist world, we'll realize that um, the people we did that to were, were us instead of them. <laughs> that mm -hmm. the people we did this to was us instead of them, um, because we're gonna we're gonna say that American citizenship there's no um, there's no color bar. So we we hurt and we bleed uh, for each other. And so when we look at Tulsa, there's gonna be a future America that looks at Tulsa and says, I can't believe we did that to us. So we did this to ourselves. Right now we are still in an America where he says we did it to them, and the them is the black people. <laughs> 
right? Yeah. But there's yeah. going to be a point where we say, wow, we did this to us. This other generation didn't perceive this group and didn't understand this was family. And we did this to us, to ourselves. Yeah. I, the news stories about it. Um, we're all exactly in that context too. This is what happened to, to these people, to, to, <laughs> yeah. to those folks, to, you know, whatever. And it's just, um, something else, and you, you touched on it just briefly, but something we've seen uh, in recent months, the rejection of the symbols of racism, statues of the Confederacy coming down, the Confederate flag being put aside by an organization like NASCAR, amongst others. How do these symbolic changes connect to the kinds of structural change we need to dismantle racism? The symbolic changes are hugely important. They, they're not enough, but they're important because you can't have anti-racism in a society that celebrates the Confederacy and celebrates these monuments to racial slavery and white supremacy. So it really is important that our built environment um, be something that's advocating for justice and equality for women, for men, for Blacks, for Native American and Indigenous, for Latinx. For, for, for immigrants, for people of color, for white people. It really, it should be a built environment that's pursuing justice for all of us. So it's, I think it's important, the corporate statements, the pro-Black Lives Matter statements, all of those are important, but then we have to dig down deep and say, what is the corporation doing vis-a-vis -vis its own culture, who it's hiring, universities, University of Texas at Austin, where I teach, everyone's come out with positive statements, but we have to hold these organizations accountable, but it is a great step because it also educates people to that history. So saying, look, you're gonna turn Juneteenth into a day of education, very, very important, but you have to do even more than that because you have to, you have to institutionalize this as a practice. Mm -hmm. Returning to the theme of criminal justice reform brought on by the murder of George Floyd. Where do you see the potential for that kind of change to happen sooner rather than later? The local level, the local level. We, we Right now we have a generational election in terms of 2020, but it's one that's fraught vis-a-vis -vis COVID-19. There's going to be allegations of fraud that are already being articulated by the president of the United States, no matter what the outcome is going to be. But at the local level, you've seen in New York City, in Los Angeles, uh, here in Austin, where different uh, police departments, different city councils have had to say certain things that um, are, are pretty progressive uh, because they've been pressured. So the local level and then local, state, uh, and then federal. The federal is gonna be um, the, the slowest in a way, even though they're gonna be critically important because they have so much funding that they can provide states. But, but lo local people are the leaders here. Tip O'Neill, the former speaker of the house uh, during the Reagan era, uh, once famously said that all politics is local <laughs> to O'Neill, you know, Irish uh, American politics, just, just, you know, very much salt of the earth. And what he meant by that was that whatever your congressperson did in a district, whatever uh, an assembly person did at, at, at one level, politics was localized to a precinct, a ward healer, um, a union, um, a block by block, a neighborhood association, a parents teacher association. So that's what we're talking about. We're really saying politics right here is at the most granular level, including your own home. You know, like what, what, what are the zoning policies in your neighborhood? Why isn't there enough density to have any people of color in your neighborhood, even as renters? And we're not talking about sky rise projects uh, from the 1960s. We're right. saying just, just, somebody having access how come there's no black children in your school and are you fine with that and what can you do um, to impact that in a positive way so we're going to see the biggest change locally and over time we're going to see more change nationally peniel joseph professor of public affairs and the barbara jordan chair in ethics and political values at the lbj school of public affairs at the university of texas austin and his latest book, The Sword and the Shield, The Revolutionary Lives of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. Peniel, thank you so much again for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Thank you for having me, Jim. Thank you. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. <laughs>
help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to keep the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. The roots of today's partisan warfare. Bill Press talks with Julian Zelizer, author of Burning Down the House, Newt Gingrich, The Fall of a Speaker, and The Rise of the New Republican Party. The whole point of your book is, it didn't start with Donald Trump. It started a lot earlier, back in uh, the 80s, maybe, with a young guy from Georgia named Newt Gingrich. Really? That's exactly right. Uh, I think if we think it all starts with Donald Trump, we have a bad understanding of the Republican Party and, and what's been happening. And I argue in the book that Newt Gingrich, who was elected in 78, came to Washington in 79. He pioneered the kind of partisanship which we're seeing all the time uh, in terms of a strategy for the Republican, a uh, burn down the House uh, anti-institution kind of partisanship, which has become the norm for the Republicans. Right. Uh, and you uh, lay that all out in the book, Burning Down the House, Newt Gingrich, The Fall of a Speaker and the Rise of the Republican Party. Great read. Very important book to understand American politics and what's going on. Uh, just recently, newly published. And again, a link to buy the book uh, is on the episode notes for today's podcast. But, Professor, you say that he arrived. OK, he arrived January 1979. He really came to Washington. You point out. Uh, determined to burn everything down, right? And to bring both parties down, not just the Democratic Party. Right. So he comes to Washington at a time when Republicans had been out of power in Congress since 1954. Uh, and so they were basically a permanent minority. And that's how a lot of Republicans thought. And they just assumed that yeah. And many Republican leaders, in his mind, were willing to live with that status quo. So his idea was for Republicans to ever win again, they were going to have to do anything. They were going to have to go there. And that meant not only take on Democrats in extraordinarily aggressive ways, but also to bring down the leaders of his own party, who he said were too comfortable with the status quo. So. I was struck by some of the adjectives and phrases you used to describe Newt. I wrote a few of them down. Ruthless, cutthroat, constant mayhem, crippling form of partisanship, take no prisoners, cannibalism. Boy, that's not the genteel bipartisan atmosphere uh, that dominated Washington before he arrived. No, that's right. And and these are words that very much reflect what he was saying in memos and letters. Uh, he was he, he often wrote to other Republicans enough with bipartisanship, enough with ideas of civility that won't get us anywhere. And he would say to leaders, we have to be more aggressive as a party. We have to be more confrontational. And really to understand Gingrich is to understand that what you see today in 220 was not the norm uh, in, in Washington. Members were very partisan, but they also were concerned about governance. They were concerned about the health of the institutions in which they worked. Gingrich really put that aside. And in his language about other members, in what he was willing to do with ethics rules, everything was fair game in his partisan wars. Right. And he said it. Um, uh, I was uh, struck to read. Uh, in, in your book in 1978, so that when he's running for election and speaking to a group of college young Republicans where he praised the Democrats because they understand, he says, that cannibalism is the nature of the business. By contrast, he went on, one of the great problems we have in the Republican Party is that we don't encourage you to be nasty we encourage you to be neat, obedient, and loyal, and faithful, and all those Boy Scout words, which don't belong in politics. Wow. 
Yeah, it's an incredible speech. And, and you know, my story will then revolve around him taking down the Speaker of the House, Jim Wright, in 1989. And when Wright resigns, he makes a speech warning that the House will be consumed by mindless cannibalism if they didn't stop right then. And so that speech back in 78 very much reflects how Gingrich thought about politics from, from the very beginning of his career. And that's why his main argument in public, in the media, wasn't so much left, right, conservative, liberal. It was anti-establishment. And the idea that Democrats were fundamentally a corrupt, autocratic party that had to be brought down by whatever means necessary. So how did this young pup from Georgia, uh, within basically 10 years, totally explode the United States Congress, bring down a speaker and bring down the Republican leadership? Well, one of the most important things he does is he uses the media to his advantage and not conservative media. He uses cable news and he uses investigative journalists. And uh, he uses both of them uh, very systematically to gain attention for the argument he's making, to go after a Democrat like Speaker Jim Wright and to criminalize him in public and get that message out and get it out frequently. Uh, there's many stories in the book where he gives cable television, the confrontation they thrive on. Uh, and, and then by doing that, even if he comes out looking bad, he's on the national news and he's making a name for himself. So the media is very important. The second thing is he basically seduces the senior Republicans who understood that he was McCarthyite, a uh, McCarthyite. And what I saw in the story was gradually Many Republicans are saying, well, he's dangerous, he's toxic, but you know what? Maybe he's our ticket to power. And they keep making a compromise and literally voting him into a leadership position in 1989, knowing what he's all about, thinking they can contain him. Uh, but those are the two, I think, storylines. The third, I would argue, is Democrats ultimately don't see what's happening. The, right. the Democrats are missing it. They can't keep up with him. And they assume he's not a norm, that he's an aberration, and that there'll be a new normal at some point, a return to normal. And they're wrong. Uh, they, they don't see how the party is changing, and he's the voice of the future for the GOP. So on, on each of those points, I mean, you indicate that I haven't talked to Brian Lamb about this, but almost that C-SPAN became the enabler mm -hmm. uh, of Newt Gingrich. I mean, he certainly saw that opportunity and seized it for his purposes, right? He loves C-SPAN. C-SPAN, uh, which is only uh, on the air for the first time since 19, in 1979, it's part of the reforms of the 70s, where you know Congress is opening itself up, throwing sunshine onto the institution, and he sees a channel that's national. And uh, each hour, it's a small channel, still gets a lot of viewers. And so he does things like in 1984, where he and a group of allies take to the floor at the end of the working day, and each day they make blistering speeches about the Democrats, saying they're weak on defense. They don't support Ronald Reagan's war against communism. They basically don't care about the security of the country. And he calls them out by name and asks them to respond. And on television, you see nothing but him speaking. But what you couldn't see was the chamber was empty. And yeah. he's using it to embarrass them, to smear their reputation. But it's incredibly effective. It gets it out there, and it ultimately gets him on national news coverage. Right. I mean, he brilliantly saw that the reforms of Watergate to basically clean up the Congress, he could use for his own purposes, right, and, and turn it into his thrust for power. Yeah, I mean, he that's how he goes after Jim Wright. The, the main weapon he uses are ethics uh, rules, which are put into place after Watergate. They're meant to create measures of accountability for members of Congress. You can only earn so much money speaking during the year. You can't you have to disclose your finances. And he sees those and he sees well, that's a perfect way to go after the Democrats. And so he starts to try to find places of gray in a member's life where they either break the ethics rule or, or skirt right close to the line. That's what Jim Wright did with a couple issues. And that's what he uses to make this argument uh, that the Democrats are corrupt. But by doing so, he turns it into a partisan weapon. He undermines the idea that these right. ethics rules will be very useful. Uh, and speaking of the leadership, do you see a parallel between 
Uh, so you had people like Bob Michael. You know, he was not a Newt Gingrich kind of Republican. But as you say, gradually they say, well, you know, maybe this guy is going to help us out. Right. So they sort of go along with some stuff. I, I, I think forward then to John Boehner uh, with the Tea Party. You know, he was not really a Tea Party person, but he sort of said, well, you know, my job may be on the line. I'm going to give them a little room. And then you flash forward to 2016 and beyond, and you've got Paul Ryan and others with Donald Trump. He's not their kind of Republican, but they sort of say, well, you know, maybe he's the best we got right now. So, it's, yeah, that, that's a pack. I mean, that's a progression there again started with Newt, but it's the same pattern, isn't it? It's exactly the same pattern. I wrote this book, most of it before Newt King, I mean, before Donald Trump was a presidential candidate. So I wasn't thinking of that, but it's the same embrace of the political bomb thrower. And Bob Michael, for people who don't know, is very much a get along kind of Republican, been around for years and didn't like to do what Newt Gingrich does. But what's amazing is over the course of the 80s, he starts to use very similar rhetoric uh, to Newt Gingrich in talking about Democrats. And even George H.W. Bush running in 1988 as vice president, he starts to talk about the Jim Wright scandal, which only Gingrich was really talking about during his campaign. Boehner did the same thing with the Tea Party, and it's this argument, well, they'll just be part of my coalition, but that's not how it turns out, and we're seeing it again and again. So the whole idea that there's this huge separation between the Republican Party establishment and this other element of the GOP, I think, doesn't really hold water, and it's not just now. This is how the this is what the party is since the 1980s. Right. I mean, it was the party of... Uh... Um, whoever, Reagan, I guess, maybe, yeah. uh, which became the party of Newt, which became the party of Trump. That's exactly right. And that trajectory is really important today if we want to see what's on the table in coming years. Now, you've mentioned um, Speaker Jim Wright a couple of times. I doubt that there's anybody listening to our <laughs> podcast who remembers what his evil crime was I had to go back and remind myself how yeah. what did he do? How bad was it? And consequences? Well, he was accused of all sorts of things, basically helping interest groups and lobbyists. It turned out most of the story in in ways that were uh, unethical. Most of them turned out not to be true. Uh, the the two issues that ultimately stuck one is he published this book of speeches. And when he would go speak to a group or a university or a trade association, he would sell it in bulk. Uh, and the reason was a member of Congress under the ethics rules could earn as many as much in book royalties as they wanted, but they could only earn so much in speaking fees. That oh, was one of his yeah, crimes. Yeah. Uh, but it was legal. It wasn't an ethical violation. It wasn't a crime. It was just doing something that didn't look good that many members did versions of, including Newt Gingrich. And uh, two, he had a, a business, legal business, with a, a real estate developer in his district in Fort Worth. And, and Gingrich basically argued, even though this was allowed and very common, that somehow it was a big corrupt scheme to put federal money into this guy's hands. It, it wasn't really big issues, but Newt Gingrich blew it up into another Watergate. And Jim Wright was kind of a fat target for a Newt Gingrich, wasn't he? Uh, he was the old school Paul, right? Right. Yeah. And he didn't think of how things that politicians did could look bad, especially if you were in the speakership. He didn't kind of clean things up in public. He wasn't media savvy. Uh, he wasn't personally liked very well by most Democrats. And uh, so all of this made him vulnerable. And he was not good in the media. So while you had this guy, Gingrich, who knew cable and investigative journalism, Jim Wright almost didn't want to speak on the shows. And so that clash was devastating to him as and, Gingrich came after him. Right. And so in the end, he just decided, um, screw it, right? I'm not going to fight this any longer. Was he forced out or? He, well, he, he, well, what happens is Gingrich builds up the case. The Health Ethics Committee starts an investigation. But in the middle of their investigation, before they're really done with anything, pressure starts to build and many Democrats start to basically give in. 
And some are whispering to reporters, maybe it's time for him to go. Others are telling Wright, I'm not sure we can stick with you. What they're really scared about is the 1990 midterm elections. Uh-huh. And, and this guy, Ed Rollins, who is a, one of the big Republican consultants, is saying to the press, I'm going to make Jim Wright target number one. And so Democrats did not have to force him to resign. He didn't have to resign. And according to all the vote counts at the time, he was safe. But he decides to do it because his party is saying they don't want to stand by him anymore. And just to put a final point on that, he was never charged with anything by the Ethics Committee, never found guilty of violating uh any of the ethics rules of the House at the no, time. No, uh, the, the first part of the investigation, which is really preliminary, said we'll look into it more, but they hadn't found anything. Even in retrospect, it, it's unclear he violated any rules uh, and nothing ever came of it. And so what came of it was enough of a public issue uh, to create the pressure on him to resign. And he also was worried about the health of the Congress. And that's another reason he himself was willing to go along with this. But as you point out, Newt had his own deal uh, uh, of selling textbooks, I believe, or something, where he was charged by the Ethics Committee and uh, later and ended up paying, what, a $300,000 fine? Yeah. I mean, it's even worse. He was there was another (laughs) scandal back in the 80s about a book. So at the time, he's going after Jim Wright for this book deal, which, again, no one sees as a huge issue. Uh, He himself is under investigation and becomes public for having published his own book. Uh, about Republican politics and raised money from interest groups in Atlanta to finance the promotional efforts. And he even has to do uh, a press conference, but he doesn't care. Gingrich says it's just different. It's not the same. And then in 1997, when he's speaker, he becomes the first speaker in American history to be fined for ethics <laughs> violation. So it, it, it suggests they don't run deep his concerns beyond what it will accomplish for him. Oh, boy. again, great stories uh, told and good to remind us where it all came from in the new book, Burning Down the House. Bill Press with Julian Zelizer, author of Burning Down the House, Newt Gingrich, The Fall of a Speaker, and The Rise of the New Republican Party. If you'd like to hear the entire interview, visit BillPressPods.com. And that's all for the America's Democrats podcast. Thank you to all who made today's show possible, Peniel E. Joseph and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook and Twitter. And leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. For the America's Democrats podcast, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us. Support the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page.